Well, they were quiet leaving today. Man, that only wakes me up. If you're here with the first time, for the first time with us, we're at Calvary Chapel, and we teach through the word, line upon line. We, we just feel that uh, Chuck Smith, when he started Calvary Chapels, the importance of knowing the word, but not jumping around in the word, following the word so you understand where it's coming from and where it's going. A lot of times topical teaching, pastors will use to deem their agenda, what they want to accomplish. And, and you can do that for a certain amount of things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but there's nothing like, if you're teaching the word and you take it in a direction that it's not what it's speaking of, the following chapter makes that so apparent that you weren't connected to what the word says. So I know when I um, came out of a Catholic background and um, saved in a Pentecostal church and uh, ended up in a Baptist church for a while and when I walked into my first Calvary Chapel, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, Goldilocks and the Three Little Bears. This one was too hard, this one was too soft, and I walked in and I went, oh, this is just right. I love the worship. I, I, it just felt connected, uh, wasn't distracting, people weren't running around or jumping around on the stage, you know, I, they, they put me in, at the feet of Christ, I just love that. And then to hear the word of God simply taught the way that the word of God is taught. And, and you just grow, it's almost like being in a Bible college when you go to church, and that's what I fell in love with, Calvary Chapel, almost 20 years ago. And so we're in the book of Ephesians, we're in chapter two, and if you have any doubt of how you're saved, what it means to be saved, this next chapter just cements it. There should be no doubt in your mind. Whenever a Christian tells me, I hope I've been good enough to make it to heaven, I take them and I say, stop there. Stop right there, because you're not good enough to get to heaven, and neither am I. God paid the price so that you and me could go to heaven. God paid the price. So to say that you hope you're good enough to get to heaven is basically saying, God, you didn't do enough. And I don't want to say that to God, do you? You know, I don't think that would even be wise. And, and yet, our human tendencies, our flesh, our, we always get ourselves in trouble because we think that we have to earn something in God, we think that it has to be painful to, to get saved. We think it has to be difficult. When you're saved, you will naturally want to do what's right by God because the Holy Spirit came into you to dwell in you, to share with you what right and wrong is. And because you understand the price that was paid for you to be saved, you will want to do good works for God. But if you think that you have to earn salvation, you will never find peace. And, and I love my Catholic brothers and sisters. I've come from that. But when I talk to them, there are some amazing Catholic Christians. Don't get me wrong. But the majority of them that just show up on Sunday, they don't get it. They're hoping that their works were good enough to get them into heaven. And, and that's a sad place to be and it's an exhausting place to be. I would never find comfort. And I use this silly illustration. I know this is a long entry here, but I want you to get this and not forget this. If I was hoping for heaven by my works, did I fall short of heaven by not praying an extra 10 minutes this morning? Did I not give enough should I have given 20 more dollars to get to heaven? Should I have done just this much more? To, did I miss heaven by an hour of not being in my Bible? I mean, you would never find rest. You would never find rest. You would never find peace. The comfort that comes from knowing that Jesus said it is finished when we trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior. So a huge introduction but let's look how Paul describes this so clearly that you have, to, you have to be blind not to see it. And he's gonna explain that if you don't see it, 
you literally are blind. And he uses even more powerful things as we look at it. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 1. Once you, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Death is separation in three ways. The, worst is a, the first is a physical death. It's when the spirit is separated from the body. The second is a spiritual death, and that's what this is being spoken of here. Maybe you've seen National Geographic and specials on zombies and Haiti and other people in, in the Caribbean. Zombies are people that walk around in an almost corpse-like state. It's due to voodooism, demons, and drug-induced states. I, I shared with you when we went to India and went into the India worship temple, at the bottom of the temple, the white the priests were dressed in white and they were going around this idol back and forth and they had a great thing, juice like running off of their face, some sort of drug inducing and they were literally zombies. They were frightening once we were down in the bottom of the temple. Um, it's a long story and I'll share it with you at another time but to actually see someone like that. Spiritually, people without Christ are like zombies. They're alive physically but they have no sensitivity towards the Lord. They're dead spiritually. And that's what we're seeing in a world that sees things that are wrong and say that they're right. You know, it's about what we shared. It's just slamming at us in every direction. Now understand, God loves everybody. God loves sinners. And we have to be loving but we don't have to accept the sin. And we live in a world where it's being forced upon us. And it's easy to look at one sin and say, well, that's the terrible sin. But <laughs> there's far more going on than the one sin that everybody does that. Lying, cheating, gossip, they're all sins. And, and they shouldn't be paraded around. And, and basically, every stupid thing I've ever done in my life had to deal with pride. I can go back to every event in my life that I wish I could go back and not done it. Pride was connected. The word that was chosen, it shows you how blind the world is that doesn't understand Christ or doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Third, there's an eternal death spoken of in Thessalonians 1.9. It refers to those that um, have refused the life-giving salvation and they're cast to outer darkness. Now, it's talking about habitual sins. Not, because we all fall short. I don't want to. I get up in the morning praying, asking the Holy Spirit to empower me, to fill me, to give me what I need to do what's right through the day. But as humans, we fall short. You know, in, in the original language, sin, the word was picked up where they would play darts. And then they would throw for the zero, right in the middle. And if they missed it in the taverns and it fell off the very middle, they would say sin. And a lot of them would have to take a drink for every time that they missed the target. Sin is, some, is basically aiming for perfect and falling short. We all fall short in some ways. Don't want to, try to get better every day, more like Christ, but we all fall short. That's not the sin that the Bible's talking about. Cast it out into utter darkness. That's saying, I know what you say, God, but it doesn't matter because I'm going to do what I want. Verse 2, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. The Greek phrase here, um, used to live in sin like the rest of the world, it meant course of this world. It refers to wind. So the implication here is whichever way the wind was blowing is the way that the unbeliever is going. And we see that today. He goes on to tell us, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in this unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Who's blowing the wind here? The Bible tells us clearly, it's Satan. He's the one dictating the trends and styles and the interests that captivated you and me before we were saved. It was when we were still dead in our sins. We're a new creation today. Verse three, all of us used to live that way, following the passions and desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. Completely caught up in our own fleshly tendencies, we were enslaved in a hopeless attempt 
to satisfy our sinful nature. There was never any peace. There wasn't enough money, there's not enough drugs, there's not enough sex, there's not enough anything to fill that hole that only God can fill. Goes on to say, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Finally, not only were we dead to sin, we're dead because of sin, we were children of wrath. We were doomed in our sin. Why were we children of wrath? Because the wrath of God is on those that do not receive the gift of salvation. A perfect God has to have a perfect relationship. How do you do that with imperfect human beings? You pay the price that they had to pay. You pay it for them. So he sees you as his children. He sees you perfect. To be able to be seen perfect and understand who we are, we should ever, forever be grateful, church. Forever grateful. I've shared with you, being in the trades, I loved perfect. I strive for perfect. The work that I did, I worked so hard to make it perfect. I said if there was a color crayon that had the perfect color, it would be called perfect. And yet, no matter how hard you try, you can't get perfect. I told George one day, and I share this because he's a master machinist, and I said, I should have done your trade. Because if I could have done your trade, I could have made things perfect. And he goes, David, there's no such thing as the word. Air in the machines can make micro changes. There is no perfect. Yet, the Father in heaven, because I trusted Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, looks down upon me, and he sees my favorite, my favorite color crayon. And, and that's pretty exciting. Now, I find the next two words that we're gonna be to be some of the most important two words in all of scripture. Even though you and me were doomed by our sin, God came through anyway. In doing the search in the Bible, I was amazed how many hundreds of times the words, but God, showed up. If you guys know Tony Chavez, it's one of his favorite two words. You hear him sharing it all the time. But God came up in the most impossible situations. And we're going to look at some of those in the Old Testament. Verse 4 starts out, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much. In spite of all the trash that ruled our lives, God still loves us. God love is part of his very being. Now, back in Genesis 20, verse 2, Abraham and his wife Sarah were traveling. And Abraham was fearful. Why? Sarah was very beautiful. Abraham knew that King Abimelech of the region would take women that he saw beautiful, and they had to travel through his area. And he knew that this king would actually kill people and take their wives. So he would add them to his his harem. So he tells um, his wife, I want you to tell people that you're my sister. And he'll take you away, but at least I won't die. Sure enough, Abimelech sees her and he takes her. Then we find out the two words, but God came into Abimelech in a dream at night and said to him, Behold, thou art a dead man, for the woman whom thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Genesis 23. Um, Abraham fell greatly. His marriage to Sarah, the leader, the husband, but God moved in unexpectedly, unpredictably, and miraculously, and he rescues them both. You know, when a Christian says to me, my wife just doesn't understand me, or a woman tells me, my husband's a fool, my marriage is a mess, do you, do you know what I do? I listen to their stories. I tell them that I can't fix their situation, but God somehow is going to come through for you. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know him. God will break through somehow. You just have to stay faithful. In Genesis 50, 20, 
After being thrown into a pit by his own brothers, he was sold into slavery. Joseph was abandoned by his family and without hope completely. But we saw the two words, but God moved him miraculously and elevated him to a position of prime minister of one of the greatest empires in the history. When Christian says to me, everyone's against me, even my own family, what do I do? Of course, I listen to their stories and I say, I don't know, but God was with Joseph and if you stay faithful, God will be with you. In 1 Samuel 23, 14, although Saul was king of Israel, he knew actually David was the one that had the anointing of God. So Saul sought to take David's life. But we see the two words again. But God delivered David not into his hand. You know, church, what temptation, what sin, what Saul is trying to take you down? You'll never be able to escape it on your own. You have to trust in these two words. But God, he can establish and he can strengthen you. Oh, pastor, you don't know the Saul that's chasing me. It's a very real temptation. I'm incre- it's an incredible, powerful, powerful problem. God's word tells us, but God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. He will provide a way of escape of every single time you are tempted. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You can say, yeah, but you don't know my situation. I said, yeah, but you don't trust the word of God. Church, God is rich in mercy. He's full of love. And he can break through your situation if you'll allow him. You know, the mess you're in might be very real. The struggle ahead of you could be exhausting. The trial you face may be overwhelming. But the message is even more powerful. But God, but God, but God. Don't forget, the only way the enemy can win is if you give up. It's the only victory he can have. We have an all-powerful God, the creator of heaven and earth. And you go, well, I've, I've been saying but God, but it's not happening yet. God's not finished yet in what's going on. Give God the time that needs, and you will always see his hand. Verse five. That even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. The noun here in the word love is agape. It means to seek the highest good in one loved. You know, today we have this word love and we use it for everything. We love pizza, we love this, we love that. It's quite different than the word agape. Agape means other-centered. God, agape means you esteem someone more than you do yourself, that you're willing to die for someone. Since sinners are spiritually dead towards God before we trusted Christ, they have nothing to draw them to God. This is why Paul describes this love as being great. God's love has done three things. It's made us alive with Christ, raised us up with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms with Jesus Christ. An unbeliever is literally spiritually dead. He is made alive by God with trusting in Christ. The only way a spiritual dead person can communicate with God is to be made alive. And that must be done by the one who himself is alive. He is a living God that we serve, who gives life to the dead, Romans 4, 17. All we have to do is respond. All we have to do is trust this word of God. You know, we watch so many wacky things said using the word of God. We watch so many things on television where they take a part of a scripture and they, and they share things that are not of God. And if someone will be honest to the word of God, taking it line upon line, precept upon precept, God's word doesn't change. Humans don't change it. It is what it is. 
And it's important to understand that. I have no excuse for what's been done in the name of religion. But I have every bit of faith in the word of God. It is simple enough for a child to understand. And when people take parts of the Bible and turn it into what they want to do with the Bible, I think that that's the problem that causes people not to trust the Bible. It's one of the reasons that I fell in love with the Calvary Chapel because they take all of the word and they follow it line upon line. Verse six, for he raised us from the dead with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. See, we're not raised from the dead and left in a graveyard because we're united to Christ. We've been exalted with him. We're sharing in his throne in the heavenlies. Our physical position may be on this earth, but our spiritual position's in the heavenly places with Jesus Christ. Amen? Oh, the amen? I don't ask for many amens. You better give me one on that. I have a hard time with the pastors going, amen, amen, through the whole sermon. Everyone has to say amen. Okay, that's enough. But I mean, when it's something like that, let's get it. Verse seven. So, God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Jesus Christ. God raised us to sit with him in heavenly places in order that we might be trophies of his grace, in order that people will look at you and me in the ages to come and say, man, the grace of God is amazing. Did you see what he did for those people? He brought Pastor Dave into heaven. And people go, oh, it's, it, 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 it's, it's incredible. All to his credit, not mine. Verse eight, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good works or things we have done. Can I read that again for you that are questioning your salvation? Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. It's all on him, church. He's done it all. How do you brag about something that someone else has done? You can't. Paul says very clearly that even the faith it took to be saved is not of ourselves. Why? Because dead people don't have faith. He's already said that we were dead as non-believers. This is why Paul states that there is none that seek after God. No, not one. Romans 3, 11. Not Pastor Dave's opinion. It's what the word of God says. If it's my opinion, I'll tell you, hey, I think this could be. But what I'm sharing here is right from the word of God. So it should not even be questioned. When you start questioning what the Bible says, you're allowing you to judge God instead of God judging you. And it's a dangerous place to be. So since we've not been saved by our good works, we can't be lost when we fall or we, or we fall short. Grace means salvation completely apart from any merit or any works on our part. Grace means that God did it all. Our salvation's a gift from God. It's a gift, not a reward. Salvation can't be of works because the work of salvation has already been completed on that cross. Am, am I making it clear enough? If you haven't got it, I can just redo the whole thing again. Just raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any hands. This work that God does, it's a finished work. We can add nothing to it or we dare not take anything from it. I saw that quote and I loved it. Verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece and he's created us anew in Jesus Christ. Now, as God's masterpiece, we're a work in process. The Bible shows us a ton of examples in this principle. God spent 40 years working on Moses before he could work through him. At the beginning of the ministry, Moses was impulsive and he depended upon his own strength. He killed the Egyptian and had to flee Egypt and it's hardly a successful way to start a ministry. 
But during those 40 years as a humble shepherd in the desert, Moses experienced God in a humble way. And God was working in his life and preparing him for the next 40 years of amazing ministry. Any time before those 40 years, Moses would never have been able to be used like he was during those times. I remember being called into ministry. And I had done probably 10 years of, of leadership and working with kids and working with teenagers and felt called to the ministry. And I remember coming to my senior pastor at the time and, and I said, man, I'm ready to go. Let's go. I've got things paid down. I can do it. And he goes, we're not ready yet, Dave. And I looked at him and go, what do you mean we're not ready? And it, it just seemed so hard. But if I had started a church at that time, I never would have survived what's happened through the years in this church. It was the probably 10, 15 years after that before God started to use us the way he used us and kept me from quitting, kept me from losing to the enemy. What was developed in those next years were critical for God to have me in the pulpit this long. It didn't feel like it at the time, it felt hard. And I say this to encourage you because if there's a calling in your life and you haven't seen it happen yet, you just haven't given God the time that you need for having you prepared not to quit, not to let the enemy win. There's other examples. Joseph suffered 13 years before God put him in the throne in Egypt. Second to Pharaoh only. David was anointed king when he was young, but he didn't gain the throne until he suffered many years in exile. Even the apostle Paul spent three years in the Arabian desert after his conversion, no doubt experiencing God's deeper work to prepare him for the ministry. God must work in us before he can work through us. So be patient. God's doing a work. Verse goes on to tell us, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Everything has been planned for us before we were put on the face of this earth. We've got to give God that and let God have that. We're created in Jesus Christ unto good works. We are not saved by good works, but we're saved into good works. The famous theologian Cal John Calvin wrote, it is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies can never be alone. We're not saved by faith plus good works, but a faith that works. The basic scripture theme is in James 2, where the writer points out that the saving faith always results in a changed life. It's not enough to say that we have faith. We have to demonstrate this faith by our works. And you've heard me say over and over again, if you can do any ungodly thing and be totally comfortable with it, something's wrong with your relationship with God. The Holy Spirit should not allow you to be comfortable with that. If you are, you really need to seek the Lord in this. Verse 11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God, without hope. Paul's saying, remember what you used to be? You were once without Christ. You had no hope without God. You were in trouble. You had no hope for a Messiah. You had no knowledge of God. You had no future. That's what people are today without Christ. You wonder why we see the madness around us. They're blind. And it's important not to get frustrated with them. It's important to love them. I had a college ministry in Livermore for, for years, and we had young men and women coming in, struggling with their sexuality, struggling with wanting to fit in. Starting, if we had rejected them or called them names or told them they didn't belong and didn't share the love of Christ with them, the love of Christ, I watched change people. I watched change people. We're not allowed to be different in the society we have. We get put in categories. 
We used to call the girls Tom girls because they like to call trees, climb trees. Now they're put in categories by believers and non-believers. And it's not fair because every human being wants to fit in. Every human being, we're, we're, if we the church are rejecting people that are a different, created by God to be different, and we're rejecting them, we reject the sin, but we don't reject the people. And, and a man can be more feminine, more creative, and he's still a man. And a woman can be more masculine in the way you do, and can still be a woman. But now everybody wants to put you into a box. And children are being forced in this and making decisions in this and having their bodies mutilated. And they have things on the ballot that say a parent can't even stop it. We have to vote right, you guys. We have to get smart. Look, don't, don't throw hate at the world. It'll never be attractive. I never would have won any of those college students to the Lord and to what the Lord says if I'd have been hateful or disrespectful or mocking or made fun of. I shared with them that you are created beautifully by the Lord. And because you don't look like this and you look like this, don't you let anyone tell you what you're supposed to be. You let the Lord tell you what you are. And that's dearly loved. Verse 13. But now you've been united with Jesus Christ. Once you were far away from him, but now, catch, but now you have been brought near to him, brought by the blood of Christ. It, the, verse 13 starts with but now. In the middle it says but now. And the but now there parallels with the but God in Ephesians 2.4. Both speak of a gracious intervention of God on the behalf of the lost sinners. Verse 14. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body, in his own body on the cross. He broke down the walls of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commands and its regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. What is God doing among us? Two things. He's creating a new person, verse 15, and a new body, verse 16. Jews and Gentiles used to feel such animosity towards each other. If a Jew even accidentally rubbed against a Gentile in the marketplace, he had to go ceremonially scrub himself. You know, the Gentile community responded by saying, Jews were the devil in person. But what did the Lord do? He took the two groups, Jews and Gentiles, brought them together into a new person, a new body, and that's what we call the church. Don't give up on the Jewish nation. God hasn't. It's going to come around. Revelation tells us that. Verse 19. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are a member of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. The cornerstone is what holds the whole building together where it starts. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of the dwelling where God lives by his spirit. As the worship team comes up, let me wrap this up for you. As we look over this chapter, we can't help but praise God for what he has done. In his grace, he has done incredible things for the ungodly. Through Christ, he raised us from the dead, he seated us on his throne, he has reconciled us, he set us into his temple. Neither spiritual death or spiritual distance can defeat the grace of God. There's nothing you've done, there's nothing you can do 
that can separate you from God. Repentance, a change of heart, and a change of direction is all he asks. He's not only saved us individually, he's made us a part of a body, and that's what we call the church. Do you ever stop and think what an incredible privilege it is to be part of God's eternal plan? Who am I that such a great thing is even possible? We should think about it a lot. We were lost, and we now get to be God's family with all the privileges that come from that. You may be in the most difficult situation imaginable today, but what gets you through is realizing what's waiting for you in the future. You are inheriting God's kingdom. You are inheriting eternity with no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more disease, no more failing. It's, 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 it, 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 it blows your mind. Can you imagine living in total righteousness and truth? No more dissension, no more lies. I long for truth in the world that we live in. I don't, I, other than the word of God, I don't know how to find it. You, you know when, when your ears are ringing constantly and you have that and you can't get away from that, there's a thousand products that guarantee that they can take care of that and, and none of them do. When, 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 when you find out you have cancer and everyone's sending you just take this stuff or just take that stuff or you know, do this or do that and it'll take care of it. And then you go to read on this stuff and half of them are telling you, yeah, it saved my life. And the other ones are telling you, this almost killed me. Um, do an Amazon search on a product that you want to buy. No, don't do it because all it does is give you a headache. First five people say it's the most wonderful thing. The next 10 people say it fell apart before they took it out of the package. How, how do you make a decision on the things of this world. Politician will tell you one thing. If you listen to this channel, you turn to this channel, a politician will tell you another thing. You, I, I so value human beings that will speak truth to me, even if I don't like what they're saying. I long for truth. I long for righteousness. I long for people to do the right thing in God's eyes. And, and it's not here. It's not here, and so we can become bitter, we can become exhausted, we can be worn out, we can lose our joy, and then what person wants to have what we have? So we as Christians have to realize this is not our home, and if God wanted us to be gone, we'd be gone by now, but people are still getting saved. We still have an opportunity to reach a neighbor, or a workmate, or a schoolmate, or somebody with things of the Lord. Every person that trusts the Lord, the Bible tells us that all of heaven rejoices. Can you imagine? Every time. And so, if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you want to light up heaven? You've got a great opportunity. And there's a, a thing that says prayer over there, and there'll be a couple of people over there, and they would love to pray with you and encourage you and make sure you have a Bible. But those of us that have trusted Christ, let's not lose our joy Let's not lose our peace because God's given us the tools not to. And we have, we're not robots. We have the ability to choose. And we, we choose God. We choose his provision. We choose his hope. And we trust him to get us through any temptation, any difficulty that seems impossible in our flesh. If we can do that, we can find a peace while we're still here till we get to where we're going. Would you stand with me? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May your week with him be sweet and oh so tender. Father, quiet us down. Help us to hear your voice. Speak to us loud, Lord. 
Show us the opportunities that you have for us. And Father, don't let us get up in the morning and don't let our feet touch the ground until we've asked you to fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit, enabling us, Lord, to truly bring you honor and glory. Not because we have to, because we want to. We love you, Lord. God bless you guys. Your name is like her.